This podcast is brought to you by Harry's. Please visit harrys.com and enter the offer code HISTORY at checkout to claim your free trial set and free post-shave balm. That's harrys.com with the offer code HISTORY. Hello and welcome to the historynetwork.org podcast. I'm Angus Wallace. With something different for you in this episode, usually you'd be hearing Nick's dulcet tones narrating one of our history essays. I'm sure many of you are aware I do a number of other podcasts other than this with Nick, one being War Games, Soldiers and Strategy. Whilst putting the latest episode of that together, I had a chat with military historian Murray Darm about friction. We chatted for 40 minutes on the topic, but I only needed four minutes for the WSS podcast. I enjoyed our chat so much, I thought you guys might like to hear it in full. So what you have here is the unabridged version of Murray and I talking Clausewitz and friction. If you don't like this format for the podcast, don't worry. Normal service will be resumed in the next episode. We start with Murray quoting Clausewitz. Friction and war. As long as we have no personal knowledge of war, we cannot conceive where these difficulties lie of which so much is said so we start with this then i think the interesting thing about Clausewitz is he's not an academic he's not an intellectual he is a military officer who served in the napoleonic war he's in the prussian army the russian army he was fighting with the russians uh at borodino he's there in 1812 he's a french prisoner of war he was chief of staff of the third corps at Ligi. He's writing from a perspective of understanding. It's a very interesting thing about the 19th century is that that you actually get so many individuals who write about war, like Tolstoy. The Borodino in War and Peace is amazing. And you sit there and go, yeah, but he's a novelist. No, but he went to the front during the Crimean War. You know, he came to fame because of his description of what was happening uh, at Sevastopol. There is that whole sort of uh, Flashman-esque, were you there? when you read your Tennyson it's all the same you know were you there I was there he was there he was there that sort of gives it it gives it that authenticity that not being there doesn't and it's a very interesting conceit that we don't have now I mean we have it in certain ways but when Clausewitz is talking about war he's seen it he's done it you know and all of the all of those theorists even your Schlieflins and your um they've all experienced war even if they've been really bad <laughs> you know when you look at when you look at your your Hagues and these world war one commanders they make woeful errors but they've experienced war and therefore well he knows what he's doing he's a soldier through and through he's been there since you know it's a, it's a very interesting thing but i think that idea of a of a a professional but not a an academic in terms of warfare is is an interesting one and something else i thought was interesting about klaus Witt's at he kind of states the obvious. <laughs> he sort of states the obvious. Yeah, it's always something that's bothered me with with ancient military theory books. That there's there's a whole series of them in in the Greek and Roman tradition that most people have never heard of or read. And if they've heard of them or read them, they're not on the on the most popular reading book. But when you compare them to the Chinese tradition of Sun Tzu and Everyone reads those, but again, they are, they are common sense. You know, when the enemy retreats, advance. When the enemy advances, retreat. When the enemy stops, attack. You're like, mm, okay. In the Eastern tradition, there's that weird sense that there's something deeper in that. And you nod your head and sagely go, wow, yeah. Whereas if a Westerner in the ancient world says that, it's like, we well, duh. <laughs> and so with the whole early modern period tradition of writing arts of war, you know, the Yomini and the, the, the Maurice and lots of different on wars, you get the theater, theoreticize. Oh, is that even a word? Theoreticization? Theoret- oh, woo. Um, it is common sense, but then most, most commanders would agree that, you know, if you mess it up with complications, you're going to, you're going to mess up a good thing. Whereas if it's, March fast, hit hard, shoot straight. You're like, damn, good advice. Well, that well, that comes down to I wonder. I wonder if a good military theorist has to be actually good at the one-liner. Yeah, well, you see, the again from my from my um, what are, my studies begin begin with the ancient tradition is the apothegmata, the pithy saying, and the pithy saying goes all the way back to Homer. Great commanders say pithy things. Uh, you know, and you get the you get the famous, you know, well, you chopped the head off the snake, or you know, Julius Caesar, you know, 
the, the dire cast, quoting Menander, as I read most recently. So all of that is absolutely about it. But it's very interesting to compare modern commanders to sort of the ancient models of, you know, are they pithy, do they say, or do they do things that are, show that they're serious and in earnest, you know, the leading from the front versus, or the, or, you know, the uh, draconian discipline where you, you know, you shoot someone for cowardice and no one's going to be a coward again, you know, all of those sorts of things. And, and even if they're not true, again, you get that too, you know, even if they're not true, then you want that rumor being spread about you because you'll get things, people will do things for you because you are this fearsome reputation we, we, we talk about pithy in actual in actual sort of perhaps more modern uh, media parlance it's it's the sound bite well you you've got that guy famously this i think it's the civil servant servant during the falklands war who purposefully delivered everything in a flat boring monotone way for the simple fact that then it was not sound biteable it was very difficult to interpret it in, you know, it's, it's not meant to be remembered as opposed to, you know, war is uh, not an independent phenomenon, but a continuation of politics by uh, different means, which is hugely memorable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think it's it's one of those interesting things in terms of what's happened, obviously, in modern warfare is the, you know, the with the Vietnam War where you've got uh, journalists What's the term they use now? Not embedded. Is it embedded? Uh, uh, yes. But I think we've know, moved on from embedded, haven't we? Yeah, we've moved into some sort of different thing. But but they were, you know, their job is to be pithy and to be emotional and to be, you know, within within a veneer of I'm detached and I'm reporting the news. It's like, no, you're actually making the news uh, by being there. I think that, yeah, that, that's given rise to the, to the one. And you look at the, now we have war by... Um, press conference where the generals give press conferences to explain what they've done or what they're doing um which is like well aren't the enemy watching because <laughs> that's it's not quite standing in front of your army waving your sword and uh, shouting your uh, speech is it no no <laughs> and i think that the it's 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 a tricky thing because one of the other things of course it's we get all the time is when you're haranguing your troops how many of them are listening or can hear you uh, you know how how well does your voice carry? Um, you know, and it's quite well in a press conference. Well, exactly, but uh, but uh, you know, if you're if you're if you're addressing five thousand men, how many of them can actually hear you? And and is there a kind of a delay whilst the guys in the front rank then put your message back? Oh, he said this. So it's a going to become like Chinese whispers, and b it's going to become pithier <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's like <laughs> I'd say, chaps, we're going to go and fight the enemy where they don't want us to fight them, and it's like we're going to go and fight the enemy. Blessed are the cheesemakers. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> and then and then you get the other one like Napoleon did and, you know, Monty did, where they learn from the direct commanding officer a whole pile of information about an individual and, you know, the four kids at home and, you know, how's the wife Marie and all that stuff. And when when they go and say that to that individual soldier, what the rest of the soldiers around them think is, my God, he knows me. He knows all of us. He knows our names. He knows our wives names he knows our children's names and in some cases it might be true you know when he's addressing the old guard absolutely you were with me at jenna you were here you were there but for the most case he has no idea who you are and it's down to your interpretation of his behaviors it's like oh my god he knows me and that that kind of psychological warfare on your own side is is very important for morale i mean that's the other thing you know morale and how morale can get sapped but as we were talking about before, it's, it's one of those things, you know, no, what's the, I can't remember who said, I think it's Schlieflin who says, you know, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Um, that as soon as, as soon as you come into contact with, with actual physical human beings, any plan on, I thought that was Clausewitz. It might have been Clausewitz, but any, any plan on paper disintegrates, you know, uh, and good commanders know that and they react situations as they arise. And whether that's, personal or whether it's because you have great mulk yeah right uh or whether it's because you have <laughs> you have great trustworthy subordinates who've been given permission to show initiative you know some of the great disasters in the british military are down to people not showing it not being allowed to show initiative it's one of those things and i think friction is such a tricky thing because it's everything it's you know it's trench foot it's 
not being feared. Should we go back to what Klaus Fitz actually says about, what do you say Klaus Fitz says about friction? Oh, I can quote from, What's your I quote? Can quote from the book. Uh, Give us the quote. Okay, here we go. As long as we have no personal knowledge of war, we cannot conceive where these difficulties lie, of which so much is said, and what that genius and those extraordinary mental powers required in a general really have to do. All appears so simple, all the requisite branches of knowledge appear so plain, all the combinations so unimportant that in comparison with the easiest problem in higher mathematics impresses us with a certain scientific dignity. But if we have seen war, all becomes intelligible and still, after all, it is extremely difficult to describe what it is that brings about this change. So to specify this invisible and completely efficient factor. There you go. Everything and everything is very simple in war, but the simplest thing is difficult. So he's pointing out basically, unless you, it's very easy for the armchair general to look at it like a game of chess, moving his pieces about with move and counter move. But actual, actually, he's pointing out that it's the unimportant that is the important thing, and the the little things, the you know things that you wouldn't. And the military historians in a long, for a long time don't consider because, you know, battles are, like we were saying before, they're blocks on a map and you move them rather than them being human beings. And weirdly, you know, with drone warfare, we're moving into a sort of stage where we've gone back to that in, in reality. Yeah, you're moving little pieces on the board, not, well, those guys haven't had, didn't sleep last night. Those guys there, they have a really bad commander who they don't trust. That guy there is an arrogant get who's not going to listen to his orders and he's going to do what he wants anyway. You know, and all, and all of those sorts of things become incredibly important, but they're very small things and they're not the sorts of things we concentrate on. Um, uh, Murray, uh, before we look at some examples of friction, if we could just take a moment for me to tell you about Harry's a friction-free shave. Like Klaus Fitz, I'm whisker-free. That's because I use Harry's razors. For years, I've been using, in my ignorance, cheap disposable razors, thinking they were good. That was until I tried razors from Harry's. They give, by a country mile, the smoothest, most comfortable shave I have ever had. They are such a pleasure to use previously with cheap disposables, after a quick shave, I would end up with a shaving rash and a face full of cuts. But not anymore, not with my Harry's razors. Why did I use disposables? Well, I couldn't face spending the money on those fancy Dan razors. And that is what Jeff and Andy thought when they started Harry's. Surely a good razor could be produced at a fraction of the cost of the current ones on the market. How could they achieve this? Well, by owning their own factory and selling direct to the customer, they can cut out the middleman and can offer quality blades at $2 compared to $4 or more if you purchase them at the store. You can get all your shaving requirements at Harry's. The razors have five blades with a lubricating strip and a trimmer blade, and you can get rich lathering shaving gel and things. Head over to harrys.com to see what they have on offer. Harry's is so confident in the quality of their blades, they want you to try their shave set for free. Yep, that's it, for free. Just cover the shipping cost when you sign up. Plus, as a special offer for fans of the show, go to harrys.com right now and enter the code HISTORY at the checkout to get your post-shave balm, which is also free. So that's harrys.com with the code HISTORY. So let's get back to Klaus Fitz. Um, we were going to look at some examples of friction affecting the outcome of... Uh... Well, I think I think the fact is that, that every battle has friction. In many ways, it's people's responses to it that, that bring about victory or defeat. Waterloo, for instance, you know, I need to win this before the Prussians arrive and then I need to defeat the Prussians. Uh, we need to fight and hold until the Prussians arrive. God, when are the Prussians getting here? Um or, you know, but then you could say that uh, uh, the farmhouse becomes a point of friction because that holds up the advance of the rest as the French focus on it, their bigger battle plan falls to pieces. So that becomes a point of friction. Yeah, well, exactly. And and so is a point of friction a point of friction or does it become one? You know, there are there are all sorts of things about how campaigns are waged. I mean, you look at Patton in World War Two, he's he's 
causing friction through personal ambition. You know, I've got to be in Messina first. I've 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 got to be across the Rhine. But I've got to, you know, and then if you're a if you're a pro pattern commentator you're like he's he's daring and dashing and you know as opposed to no he jeopardized the entire operation through his arrogance whereas you know his commanding officer bradley is the far more boring by the book let's just do things in a plotting kind of this then that way from a from a high command perspective it's like well he's more reliable and you know what you're getting you look at el alamein it's a battle of defense all of those sorts of things are friction you know, the number of defeats, the, the man you're fighting. It. Not getting through the minefields not, as fast not, as expected. Yeah, exactly, getting caught in daylight with the enemy sort of being able to fire down on you and, and, you know, relying on morale. The whole coming back to, you know, Napoleon saying he's fighting an army of shopkeepers, but, but they're British and therefore they're, they're stiff upper lip and they're, well, will go on regardless is fascinating. Whereas when you look at earlier war where militia are involved, you know, militia are notoriously fickle. On the, on the battlefield and whether it be in, in reality or in film where, you know, they get rallied to one last charge and win the battle through their, through their being ability to being rallied. Uh, it's yeah, all of those, all of those things. So that comes down to leadership, being able to uh, hold your men Well, together. exactly. And, and this, that again becomes a, a matter of, uh, you know, f- f- for the chance of a bullet, your leader's gone or, uh, he's not there, you know. Uh, uh, another one I noted was at Husky, uh, the invasion of Sicily. The uh, naval uh, fleet opened fire on the airport contingent as they came over by yeah. accident. Yeah, well, pretty far. Um, which scattered the landings. At which point, leadership becomes higher. Leadership certainly becomes relatively relevant because everyone's all over the place, and it's almost it's, it's almost at the point of each man to himself. So you've famously got Gavin there struggling to control his own men because then he's just mixed up with everything. So that is a huge point of friction. You know, one guy opening fire opens the whole fleet up on the, on the airborne. And before long, the whole airborne part of that mission has fallen to pieces. Well, you've also got the problem then that will trust between your different nationalities and different units is going to be shot because there's a, there's a, you know, well, you shot my men. Um, why am I going to trust you? Why am I going to do what you ask? Which is a massive problem. And one, another one in, in the Korean War, uh, I think it's when the Gloucestershire Regiment was being was was you know hard pressed, and they rang the American commanding officer, rang them, and the 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 man from Gloucestershire said things are a bit sticky in American parlance. That's like oh, so you're fine. Whereas in British parlance, things are in dire dire trouble if you say something nearly so frank <laughs> you know bit sticky things are things are bad but the american you know the americans didn't understand it but you get that you get that all the way back in you know the ancient war when the roman legion fought the the greek phalanx the the roman legionaries didn't understand uh, that when a when a pikeman put his pike directly vertically into the air he was surrendering but they hadn't fought pikemen before so therefore they stabbed them all you know, and and similarly, Agincourt, where you have the rumor that you know that the the French were massacring the baggage train, so they put all of the prisoners to death. You know, and a rumor can spread. You know, there's nothing faster than rumor. And on the battlefield, you've got you know the number of incidents where you have a rumor that a, a commander, especially a a charismatic and morale boosting leader, has been killed. And so many anecdotes of military history are about either the commander proving they're not or the commander showing that they're not I mean, even 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 um nelson at trafalgar you know the, the the moving moving him off away so that you know they can't see it and that you know the, the rumor wouldn't be that he died so that no one sees it happening or whatever all those sorts of things they're all friction so how do we resolve friction how do we negate friction how do we what does Clausewitz have to say on solving it working around it train uh and you have to basically react. I do. I do have a. I do have a quote. Perseverance in the chosen course is the essential counterweight, provided that no compelling reasons intervene to the contrary. So that comes kind of down to morale. You got to kind of, as as you keep mentioning, you. Know, it's actually keeping morale up to keep, or uh, as Churchill famously kept putting in, you know, keep buggering on. Mm-hmm. KBO used to say yeah. in his letters, didn't he? Keep yeah. buggering on. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's one of those it's one of those things that you get, you know, that a bad plan today is still better than 
a great plan tomorrow. Um, and militarily, I think, you know, you trust to, you trust to your men and your equipment. I mean, obviously, you know, guns jamming, powder getting wet, munitions not getting where they should be. All of those are friction. When you look at things like Merrill's Marauders and, and the Chindits, that, that basically is <laughs> like, I'm going to do everything against you. See if you, see if you can cope. And, you know, those sorts of, those sorts of missions where they, where they persevere against the odds and do things that were not expected are perfect sort of examples of overcoming friction, even when you've given yourself all that friction in the first place. Is there any criticism? I've not, I've not have an answer for this, but are you aware of any criticism of Klaus Fitz and some of his ideas? Uh, I think there, there, there is criticism of Clausewitz in terms of the sort of afterlife of Clausewitz, how Clausewitz has been used to justify uh, anything. Um, and that's not what Clausewitz is talking about. I think he's been, you know, he's been, he's been singled out as being the, like, like Machiavelli in a way, but of course Machiavelli was far harsher and and I don't think Machiavelli would mind. A Machiavellian. Yeah. Whereas I think whereas I think <laughs> Klausowitz is not is not justifying the. He's not saying it's just a means to an end. He's not saying that. Um, so I think a lot of people who are criticising Klausowitz haven't read him. They've read some pithy comment of his, and then someone probably applying the pithy comment on Klausowitz. Um, it's like you know. It's, I think I think wasn't it in was it on, was it in Wall Street? No, that was um, that was Sun Tzu. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah. It's funny how these tropes sort of get uh, wheeled out as sort of they they they, they become business management speak now, haven't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't I don't know, I don't know of a class of it's for for management. There is there are multiple Sun Tzu's for for business management. There's even an Attila the Hun for business management. Well, you see, even even you know the seven. The Seven Habits of Wealthy People, is that the one? One of the early ones is set in ancient Babylonia, weirdly. Yeah, I think Clausewitz isn't read by people. Uh, he's he's quoted by people, but they haven't read Clausewitz. They've read that, you know, war is a continuation of politics by other means. That's it. That's the only thing they know about him. Um, How about uh, Amazon have... Uh... Klaus fits on strategy and inspiration insight for a master strategy strategist in the business section. Okay. <laughs> oh, but it's but it's it's just Clausewitz. Yeah. As in as in it's not it's not someone re reinterpreting Clausewitz for um. No no no. That's no. What it's how to. Well, right. I think it's how to you know use Clausewitz ideas in a business. Clausewitz and business. Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, okay. Well, that's, that's yeah. There you go. But uh, I love how they miss, you know, like the Sun Tzu ones, which are like. So when when Sun Tzu killed the head concubine, what he was doing was, you're like, no, no, he killed the head concubine. That you know, there's no. Uh, that's that's firing the former CEO. That's, well, that's what well I've the, the, the interesting piece of uh, I said potential criticism because I don't know if this is a criticism. It's not really a criticism. Is it's not really hit, written by him, is it? It's written by his wife. So I find that intriguing because he wrote it and it's a series of notes, a series of essays a series that he continually wrote and rewrote as he was living the experiences. But after he died in 1831, I think, and it was cholera, his wife took his papers and produced the book. Uh, presumably his original papers existed. It'd be interesting to compare what, how his wife interpreted what he'd written and how consistent he was and what was rewritten. If there's a good PhD study there. Uh, uh, and when he changed his mind on certain things and what he crossed out after, uh, you know, uh, the, the the French advance in, in Russia, you know, what was he busy, busily crossing out or uh, adding in or... Uh... <laughs> mm. Well, I think I think it's also one of those things about... You know, you look at Socrates, for instance. We don't have anything by Socrates. We have things by Plato and Xenophon. And he was he was a, an oral teacher. Uh, and he was, you know, always modifying in discussion what he was saying. And when you write it down, it suddenly becomes, you know, gospel. Whereas if you are continuously evolving a series of notes... And, I mean, it would be interesting because, of course, he would be talking to people who most of them would have also been 
experienced in war. And therefore, there would have been some very robust discussion, I would have imagined. And so it would be interesting to trace, and it's probably impossible because we don't have the drafts of the notes, uh, as far as I know, to, to see what he went into this lecture saying this and then through discussion changed it to this in the next lecture. You know, and again, yeah, as you say, when the, the disastrous invasion of Russia occurred, what would have been said, you know, at the beginning when everything was going brilliantly and then at the end when everything went horribly, it's like, oh, I'll rewrite that. You can just imagine the, 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 the unpublished essay of a war on two fronts. Best idea ever. Um, <laughs> it's like, oh, well, <laughs> I've been that I have one. a sneaky suspicion actually started his notes at supposedly post-1816, mm. so the war had finished. But right, uh, right, true. Uh, he was still active after that into the 1830s, so you'd, we'd have to find more... Uh, Bet, but better uh, things to compare it against. Yeah, well, I think it would be I, interesting, though, wouldn't it? I wonder absolutely, if it do exist. And I think the the other thing I love uh, in that Borodino description of of Tolstoy is his talking about you know when you're fighting a battle, you have no idea what's going on. You know, you understand what's going on for you and in your general vicinity, but you don't understand what's happening on the left or on the right or in the center. Word may get to you during the battle that something's happened in one of those places, but you don't know if it's true or not. And yet talking to veterans of battles soon after battle, they all seem to have this paper map idea of, you know, we held them on the left and then our right advanced and we pushed them back in the center and, you know, they fled. It's like, well, how did you find that out? That wasn't, you know, you were you were on the left. You were holding. You had no idea what the other parts of the field were doing, but through rumor and talk and you know, sort of consensus, if you like, the story of the battle becomes standardized, even among the people who fought it. Well, that's what Waterloo's famous for. That isn't it? Because they didn't they write an official. They, 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 there's, a, there's an official sort of thing. And Wellington, weirdly, after, Wellington also wrote an essay on Waterloo, which I I discovered. Uh, had been recently I thought to myself I'll have to um, hunt that down because it would be interesting to see what he wrote it would also be interesting to see when he wrote it compared to other um, uh, memoirs yeah well there's the there's the story of the diorama yes that's the story I was thinking of yeah 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 and it keeps changing and you you can't show that you show it this way yeah uh, okay, it, it, that's supposedly the story of they, they're trying to get the definitive picture of how the battle went, weren't they, on the diorama? And they interviewed a lot of officers at the time, didn't they, to try and get this definitive picture? And, it, and, and they, they're, they're, nobody's still happy that it's definitive. It's still relatively dis- disputed. Well, it's also the interesting thing that it's regarded <laughs> as an, a British victory, and you're like, well, no, there were only, you know, there were more more Dutch and. Brunswickers and uh, you know Nassau and King's German Legion and you know you, you, you less than fifty percent of the British force was in was was British and then there's the Prussians who've got you know uh, fifty thousand coming later so it's like yeah it's hardly British is it but uh, that's the way it got painted. Well, we, you know, it, you, know we, you then move into the Pax Britannica. You know, we, we were writing the we were writing the history <laughs> of the. Uh, 19th century yeah and as you say Brit- you know british commander well not british but well irish so therefore yeah we'll take him you know because he did something good if he'd lost would have oh, a bloody irishman um and it's such a fascinating aspect that you know and, and in many ways friction continues because what if you were one of them who was like well no that's not how it happened that's no no that's not what we did we we were we were doing this it's like, no, 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 that's not what the official battle, you know, that's not what the official account of the battle tells us you did. Uh, and it's funny because you get battles where, you know, Little Bighorn or Balaclava, where the main action of the battle is a source of contention and remains so, you know, and even with archaeology that's sort of looking at the battlefields and discovering, well, this is what we think happened. And then, like, well, how do we how do we explain the, the order for who charged it? Balaclava, how you know who blundered, and is there is there a scapegoat or or, or what, you know, and this that's still quite a hot topic between historians of the Crimean War, uh, and some similarly similarly with um, uh, Custer, uh, you know, uh, but they're they're all friction too. I have a modern a modern example of friction. 
a very well known model of friction, and it's a mm. nice little model of friction. So there's you know the whole Bravo two zero, the SAS patrol gets spotted by uh, you know a small boy, so they don't kill the boy, and that is the point of friction that upsets the whole mission. That's the that's the key thing from that on then on in, everything is it goes wrong. Um, so yeah, that it, it, it's still very valid, and that's quite a, you know, a small scale thing rather than you know. All the all the tanks in Omaha Beach, or most of the tanks not arriving on, be- uh, on the beach at Omaha because they sank, is a is a much bigger example of uh, of friction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, it's funny because of one of the other things is is the packaging of it. You know that if we kill the boy and the mission goes badly anyway due to another unforeseen aspect of friction, how are we going to look if we say we didn't? If we did kill the boy, and so you get that you get that Chris Ryan packaging in in a sense. Uh, well, well, we're going to be morally upstanding individuals. We're not going to commit war crimes. We're not going to do what the enemy does the way we depict them. And I think those great books of military blunders with the with the tanks on D Day. It was like, oh, well, we're afraid of shell fire from the boat. We'll put them in their little floating tanks a mile out. It's like. Are oh, you idiots? Well, that's interesting. When does a blunder become friction, and, and vice versa? I think if it, yeah, I think a blunder becomes friction when it is shown to affect the outcome of the battle. If you win the battle anyway, it's it's something that happened. It was a blunder, but it wasn't. It wasn't. You know, it, it wasn't definitive. A, a blunder could only happen if you lose. If you win, the blunder's friction. Oh, nice, nice, nice. That's that's succinct. <laughs> that would work, wouldn't it? It would. It would. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it would, yeah it's not an error if you win, because you get to write the history. Coming back to the the packaging of it, with, with with the older the history, the more you know. When Julius Caesar boasts of killing an entire uh, tribe of German, they is it the Helvetii? Yeah, he kills them in a night. You know, they they stab mercilessly for eight hours and wipe out the entire tribe uh and that to us is a is an atrocity but he doesn't paint it as an atrocity he paints it as a you know necessary uh way of getting rid of a troublesome neighbor and you know it's like look at the land i freed because i just killed four hundred thousand of them great whereas you can't you can't you know we'd call it ethnic cleansing uh and you know, if you go around boasting, if you go around boasting of ethnic cleansing, you're in a very dark passage. You know, um, <laughs> I think. Do you think we're about frictioned out? I think so. I think. I, I think it's a fascinating subject. So that was Mary and I chatting friction. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to hear more on friction and war gaming, have a listen to the War Games Soldiers and Strategy podcast. If you want to hear more of Murray. He's a regular on the Ancient Warfare magazine podcast. You can find all the links on the website, thehistorynetwork.org. As I say, normal service will be resumed and Nick will be back with you in the next podcast. But for now, I'm Angus Wallace and thanks for listening.